Good morning and welcome to uh, Coffee with Sister Jacinta as we continue our spiritual journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We will begin, as always, with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. These are ejaculations that you find in the opening of a chaplet called the Chaplet um, to the Holy Wounds, and of course called the Rosary to the Holy Wounds. But uh, the prayers are, O Jesus, divine Redeemer, be merciful to us and to the whole world. Amen. Strong God, holy God, immortal God, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Amen. Grace and mercy, O my Jesus, during these present dangers, cover us with thy precious blood. Amen. Eternal Father, grant us mercy through the blood of Jesus Christ thine only Son, grant us mercy, we beseech thee. Amen, amen, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hi. So today we are continuing with the catechism and we are on number 1652. And we're looking at the beautiful sacrament of matrimony. And the title for this section here is The Openness to Fertility. By its very nature, the institution of marriage and married love is ordered to the procreation and education of the offspring, and it is in them that it finds its growing glory. Children are the supreme gift of marriage and contribute greatly to the good of the parents themselves. God himself said, it is not good that man should be alone. And from the beginning, he made them male and female, wishing to associate them in a special way in his own creative work. God blessed man and woman with the words, be fruitful and multiply. Hence, true married love and the whole structure of family life, which results from it without diminishment of the other ends of marriage, are directed at disposing the spouses to co cooperate valiantly with the love of the creator and savior, who through them will increase and enrich his family day to day. And this is something that in our time, very strangely, um, it is not seen as a gift. So often we are fed um, the line about being responsible and taking birth control and you know preventing children and this is always seen as a curse throughout scripture if one is barren okay um you know they the family is looked down upon they are maybe you know considered maybe sinful that that god would not bless them with children and whenever like you know they had the ark of the covenant okay come into an area the, and there was this greater um, procreation um, among people as well as among animals. This was seen as the um, knowledge that God was blessing. Okay, um, it was seen as His, you know, just abundant um, gift. And so it's a very, very strange time that we're living in today that would instead see children as um, a problem as something to be freed of, um, as something to be aborted. And um, it is really um, the horror, okay, um, of our day. It's the scourge of our time. Um, it is um, a source of abundant grief and tears, okay, for our Lord. And, um, and therefore, this openness to children is something we really, really need to hold, okay, when we're married. For those of us who are not, and we see families that are, being able to congratulate them and even to help them if we have means. I remember I was working with a lady one time and she was speeding, okay, through a town and um, she got stopped by the police. And, um, and as the police was um, you know, coming out of his car, all of a sudden he sees all three of her children, like all like putting their faces to the window to see what's going to happen, you know, what's going on. And he was so mindful of the sacrifice to be a mother and to provide for children that he was gracious enough to give her a warning instead. 
Okay, and you know, you see these beautiful acts of charity done, okay, all over. You know, people realizing, you know what? My kid grew out of these clothes. Those kids are going into that same age and just finding a bag of clothes on, the, on, the, on their porch, you know, um, giving us, you know, a way of supporting and helping. These are beautiful things. Um, when I was growing up, okay, um, I come from a large family and I remember that when my dad would go to a particular store, the manager would keep all the things that um, were now overdue, okay, or, you know, like past the date, which were absolutely fine to use, okay, they were canned goods, and, you know, we would be able to bring those home, and, you know, how many provisions people just provided, and, and God opened doors, you know, that which seemed impossible with the, um, the wages that my dad was bringing in, God made possible, he can multiply things, um, and, and, you know, and just moving other people to charity and, and not being afraid of that. You know, we're so afraid sometimes of uh, being looked down as being poor and deprived of vacations and whatever. I mean, what is that compared to having eternity? And, um, you know, these things are fleeting. This world is not a permanent city. And keeping that in mind is super, super important because so often we make this world the end all be all. And, and then we become close to children and, and we see them more as a burden than a blessing. So again, you know, we read about this, if we're young and we're hearing this, you know, be open, trust, okay? Um, you know, even if it's through, you know, lots of um, pressure and, 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 you know, you're looking at the wallet with nothing in it, you know what I mean? But know that, that God is there. And, um, and then for all of us who are not, be willing, you know, to share with those whom you see um, could always use, um, you know, a, a gift. You know, how beautiful it is sometimes when a family comes up to the counter and finds out the person in front of them paid their bill. Um, you know, these are just beautiful acts of random charity and, and so often can lighten the load. Uh, I remember that was something Scott Hunt that mentioned, you know, and... Um, you know, when they, when they were open to children because they found out that birth control was something that was totally contrary to God. And, um, you know, and they ended up having six children and they were still paying off loans. And, um, you know, they, the willingness for someone to help them and later on for them to help another, uh, just keep on, you know, pushing forward or whatever their word is, okay, you know, um, and, and giving it to the next person is something that is just, on a human level, so encouraging. So we go to 1653 and we read, the fruitfulness of conjugal love extends to the fruits of the moral, spiritual, and supernatural life that parents hand on to their children by education. And I'm gonna stop right there. You know, it's one thing to be a physical mother or a physical father, but it cannot end there, all right? The duty, okay, of being a parent is huge. All right. Um, truly, you know, that willingness to be their educator, to be a disciplinarian, to be a, an encouragement, um, to be a, a moral example. Okay. And, um, you know, this is principal um, responsibility of parents. You are to personify God. Okay. To that child. And, you know, so that willingness to be able to discipline and say no to something because it wouldn't be for their good, all right? And not just to be able to please them, okay? Um, because it could be to their ruin. So that recognizing, again, that, 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 that very, very great obligation, okay? That, you know, mothering is, you know, it's only a few months, okay, when it comes to being that physical mother, okay? Um, it, it, it's a whole lifetime, okay? of being that spiritual, moral, educational um, mom and, and dad. So uh, taking that role on, educating yourself, looking at your lifestyle and maybe knowing that, you know what? That's not something I wanna to model to my children. So often that becomes the gift of children that they help us to begin to clean up our act, okay? So in this sense, the fundamental task of marriage and family is to be at the service of life. Spouses to whom God has not granted children can nevertheless have a conjugal life full of meaning in both human and Christian terms. 
their marriage can radiate a fruitfulness of charity, of hospitality, and of sacrifice. And again, it's not to allow us then just to be selfish and indulgent, okay? Um, this is a God's mystery of why some can have children, some cannot, but um, it isn't for us to just become focused on ourselves. Again, we're made in the likeness of God. He is the giver. And so looking at ways to be charitable, to be hospitable, to make sacrifices. Okay, domestic church is part six of this section. And it says, Christ chose to be born and grow up in the bosom of the holy family of Joseph and Mary. The church is nothing other than the family of God. From the beginning, the core of the church was often constituted by those who had become believers together with all their household. When they were converted, they desired that their whole household should also be saved. These families who became believers were islands of Christian life in an unbelieving world. And again, we're seeing that same sense right now. Okay, um, this was a time past, but it really is now a time present where we may be an island of Christian, okay, um, living in an unbelieving world. Let it, let it be um, a safe harbor for anyone. So in our own time, in a world often alien and even hostile to faith, believing families are of primary importance as centers of living, radiant faith. For this reason, the Second Vatican Council, using an ancient expression, calls the family the Ecclesia Domestica. It is in the bosom of the family that parents are by word and example, the first heralds of the faith with regard to their children. They should encourage them in the vocation which is proper to each child, fostering with special care any religious vocation. So again, if you want to foster vocation, okay, and that is to married life, to the single consecrated life, okay, or to the um, religious life, there is that need for virtue. You know, if you work towards honesty, if you work towards prudence, you work towards justice, you work towards thoughtfulness, um, these are things that allow them to be open then to the movement of the spirit and to then be willing um, to embrace the vocation that God has particularly called them to, which will bring them to the greatest happiness and holiness. And um, so again, fostering, okay, for those, you know, who have children who are looking toward religious life, you know, um, not to hinder that, okay, um, but to foster it. It is here that the father of the family, the mother, children, and all members of the family exercise the priesthood of the baptized in a privileged way by the reception of the sacraments, prayer, and thanksgiving, the witness of a holy life, the self-denial, the act of charity. Thus, the home is the first school of Christian life and a school for human enrichment. Here, one learns endurance and the joy of work, eternal love, generous, even repeated forgiveness, and above all, divine worship in prayer and the offering of one's life. Okay, we must also remember the great number of single persons who, because of the particular circumstances in which they have to live, often not their choosing, are especially close to the heart of Jesus and therefore deserve the special affection and active solicitude of the church, especially of pastors. Many remain without a human family, often due to conditions of poverty. Some live their situation in the spirit of the Beatitudes, serving God and neighbor in exemplary fashion. The door of homes, the domestic churches, and the great family which the church must be open to all of them. No one is without a family in this world. The church is a home and family for everyone, especially for those who labor and are heavy burdened. All right, so... You know, there are, okay, people who are single, okay? And again, it can be all different kinds of circumstances. The poverty might be that there was no, <laughs> no one out there, okay, to marry, okay? You thought you were called to marriage, but, you know, the right guy or the right girl did not come along. Um, you know, and, and yet, then don't waste that time. Consecrate that chastity, okay, to God, okay? 
If he wishes later to call you to marriage, absolutely fine, but use it for his glory. Testify to your love of God, to him ruling your decision. Be available to assist others. So often this is the gift of being single that is not possible for those who are in religious life or those who are married. Um, because they have to be able to take care of the particular family, okay, whether it's the consecrated family, the religious family, or whether that's the natural family um, and having to be there. But when one is single, there's a freedom um, that allows you to be of service where others cannot be. So, um, you know, again, it's not towards ever selfishness, okay? Um, and just, again, let, let God, you know, decide how your future is. Leave yourself open um, and, and then accept every day as his will and, and use it to the fullness of grace. Um, and that's, that's where he is. That's, we can't live the past and we can't live the future. We can only live the present. Okay, so we're now at the in brief. Okay, it's like a little review. And if you're in your books, we're on 1659. St. Paul said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Okay, even to the point of laying down his life. Okay, it's a huge order. Um, this is a great mystery. And I mean, in reference to Christ and the church. The marriage covenant by which a man and a woman form with each other an intimate communion of life and love has been founded and endowed with its own special law by the creator. By its very nature, it is ordered to the good of the couple, as well as to the generation and education of children. Christ the Lord raised marriage between the baptized to the dignity of a sacrament. The sacrament of marriage signifies the union of Christ and the church. It gives spouses the grace to love one another with the love with which Christ has loved his church. The grace of the sacraments thus perfects the human love of the spouses, strengthens their indissoluble unity, and sanctifies them on the way to eternal life. Okay, great graces that we don't want to forego. Marriage is based on the consent of the contracting parties, that is, on their will to give themselves, each to the other, mutually and definitely, in order to live a, con a covenant of, of faithful and fruitful love. Okay, since marriage establishes the couple in a public state of life in the church, it is fitting that its celebration be public in the framework of a liturgical celebration before the priest or a witness authorized by the church, the witnesses and the assembly of the faithful. Unity, indissolubility and openness to fertility are essential to marriage. Polygamy is incompatible with the unity of marriage. Divorce separates what God has joined together. The refusal of fertility turns married life away from its supreme gift, the child. The marriage, the remarriage of persons divorced from a living lawful spouse contravenes the plan and law of God as taught by Christ. They are not separated from the church, but they cannot receive Eucharistic communion. They will lead Christian lives, especially by educating their children in the faith. Okay. So if one, okay, has chosen to contract a marriage outside of the sacrament, okay, um, because they are divorced, you cannot receive Holy Communion. You're not what's called excommunicated, okay? You need that confession and you need that change, okay, in your life. Um, because marriage, again, okay, it is a symbol of the constancy, the fidelity of Christ even when Israel, Judah, the bride, us, okay, fall away. He remains faithful. So um, our Lord has put that stipulation on marriage. And again, the church tries to have as much open arms as possible to support you, okay? Um, even in your bad decisions, okay, not ever condoning it. Uh, and so letting you know, even then, and if you are staying in that marriage, okay, 
which is not sacramental, okay, and not, um, you know, what Christ is asking of us. Yet, if you have those, if you have children now, educate them in the faith, be examples to them. Okay, the Christian home is the place where children receive the first proclamation of the faith. For this reason, the family home is rightly called the domestic church, a community of grace and prayer, a chosen, I'm sorry, a school of human values and of Christian charity. All right, so let's hope that we can make our home such. And um, again, that's what that grace from the sacrament of matrimony will assist us with, okay? That is amazing, okay? It's really beautiful. And because it's not a one-time deal, it wasn't just received on the day of your marriage, but a grace that is actively being given to you as you live out your marriage vow. All right. So now we're on chapter four, and this is called Other Liturgical Celebrations. So we finished going through each of those sacraments, okay? Again, there are seven that have been named by the church as means of grace instituted by Christ, all right, that are outward signs, things that we can see, hear, feel, touch, smell, um, but there are other gifts that the church has given, okay, um, and when the church is trying to figure out, you know, are they sacraments, okay, strictly or not, um, we came up with a mean called sacramentals, and these are things that are outward, Matt, things that we can see, they do obtain for us graces, but they weren't instituted by Christ themselves, okay? That does not make them not means of grace. They, they definitely are, but they're not with that amazing amount of grace that was received in those seven sacraments, okay? So sacramentals is like small, okay? Like a small kind of similar thing to a sacrament. So here we are, 1667. Um, Holy Mother Church has moreover instituted sacramentals. These are sacred signs which bear a resemblance to the sacraments. They signify effects, particularly of a spiritual nature, which are obtained through the intercession of the church. By them, men are disposed to receive the chief effects of the sacraments and various occasions in life rendered holy. So again, these are going to be assisting us on the way. And we're looking at 1668. Sacramentals are instituted for the sanctification of certain ministries of the church, certain states of life, a great variety of circumstances in Christian life, and the use of many things helpful to man. In accordance with bishops' pastoral decisions, they can also respond to needs, cultures, and special history of Christian people of a particular region and time. They always include a prayer, often accompanied by a specific sign, such as a laying on of hands, a sign of the cross, or sprinkling of a holy water, which we recall our baptism. Sacramentals derive from the baptismal priesthood. Every baptized person is called to be a blessing and to bless. Hence, lay people may preside at certain blessings. The more a blessing ceremony, ecclesial and sacramental, the more is its ardent desire. Oops. Okay, let me do it again. <laughs> Sacramentals derive from this baptismal priesthood. Every baptized person is called to be a blessing and to bless. Hence, lay people may preside at certain blessings. The more a blessing concerns ecclesial and sacramental life, the more is its administration reserved to the ordained ministry, that is bishops, priests, and deacons. Okay, so the more similar it is to an actual sacrament, the more that particular sacramental is given over to a priest, okay, to administer um, or bless um, or, or to give. So sacramentals do not confer the grace of the Holy Spirit in the way that the sacraments do, by the, but by the church's prayer, they prepare us to receive grace and dispose us to cooperate with it. For well-disposed members, the faithful, the liturgy of the sacraments and the sacramentals, 
signify almost every event of their life with the divine grace which flows from the paschal mystery of the passion, death and resurrection of Christ from the source of all sacraments and sacramentals draw their power. Okay, so let me just start that part over there again. Okay, and most of this I've already said, okay, but just wanna make sure I get that paragraph read nicely. Sometimes I get tripped up, okay, and it comes out the way I say that sentence. So sacramentals do not confer the grace of the Holy Spirit in the way that sacraments do, but by church prayer, they prepare us to receive grace and dispose us to cooperate with it. For well-disposed members of the faithful, the liturgy of the sacraments and sacramentals signifies almost every event of their lives with the divine grace which flows from the paschal mystery of the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. From this source of sacraments and sacramentals draw their power. There is scarcely any proper use of material things which cannot be found directed toward the sanctification of men and adapted to praise the people of God. All right, so getting to that paragraph, okay, again, we're working with the idea of how powerful both the sacraments and sacramentals are and helping us then to receive graces and, um, mm -hmm. and these, these graces, if they get their derived their power from the sacraments. Okay, especially, again, that the sacrament of, of the Holy Eucharist because it is the source and the sum of all the sacraments because it is Christ himself. And I think we'll end right there and then we're gonna look at some various forms of sacramentals. All right, thank you. And let's close with a prayer to our angels. Um, the Father, Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love and trust me here ever this day, be at my side to light, to guard, to rule and guide, amen. To the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>